Hello and welcome to Tech Deck Karaoke. I am Joe Onisic, your host for this show, and we are very proud to be the number one Joe Onisic hosted Tech Deck Karaoke show on the internet. We are joined today by Sabrina Schaefer Esquire, who as a bar certified attorney will be our impartial judge as to who presents this slide deck better. We are also uh, joined by James Urquhart, who I will allow to in introduce himself. Yeah, hi, uh, James Urquhart. I am uh, currently a uh, principal technologist at VMware, working on VMware Tanzu, um, but uh, also in the past have uh, been a, a blog on cloud computing back in the early days, with a blog called The Wisdom of Clouds, um, one of the consistently rated one of the top blogs in that area, and then uh, a recent author of Hold on. Flow architectures. Whoa, I'm getting it on camera. There you go. Flow architectures, the future of uh, streaming and event driven integration, which uh, I encourage everyone to check out. Excellent. Thank you, James. And so, James has a vast experience, a lot of future thought leading thoughts and a ton of very interesting information. So it's going to be amazing to open up his slide deck for the first time and try and present intelligently. James, would you uh, please confirm that I have just received the slide deck and have not looked through these slides? I literally sent it to you a minute before we started recording. So I am certain you have not had a chance to digest those slides. Impartial judge, is that true? Seems right to me. I, I think so. Okay. Well, then let us share these slides. All oh, right. Up. There you yeah. go. Let's see what you got, Joe. Excellent. Are we ready? We are ready. We, we, we are ready. So I am happy to present physics and why your future software will be crap. It is very important to understand that what you'll be developing moving forward is going to be crap. And so what we want to do is ensure that you're aware of that, but more importantly, you understand why it's going to be crap. Without further ado, this is some space stuff. If you look at this, it could also be some other non-space stuff, but primarily it's space-related stuff for the purpose of this conversation. When we're looking at data, let's start off with a concept of principles of data gravity. Now, this original concept came from Dave McCrory, and the idea being wherever I'm placing my data, my applications and services will have a natural gravitational pull to that or a natural attraction to that. The example being Amazon S3 storage. If I'm putting my data in Amazon, I'm most likely going to place my apps and services there near the data for the purposes of performance through latency and cost through egress and ingress charges. With that level set, let's take a look at some very funky artwork, particles <laughs> as described by a wave function. We're looking at this from the perspective of, I have absolutely no clue what the heck I would say on this slide. I'm really trying to figure out what I would talk about, but I'm just gonna read the slide to make it sound like I know what I'm talking about as most presenters would do. So particles are described by a wave function, which simply calculates the probability of the particle being at any one location in space time. So we're really just looking at calculating the probability of that particle at a given location in space time. And the way this applies to data gravity will eventually become clear to both me and you as the audience as we start to look at state changes that may be measured by a wave function. This simply calculates the probability of the state change being important in any given context. So what we're looking at here is, do I care? And if we're talking about the fact that your software is going to be crap, you really should care. <laughs> Constructive interference versus destructive interference is really a slight difference in what we're looking at from a wavelength. Going from a wavelength plus a wavelength to another sine wave or a wavelength to a wave plus a wavelength becoming your dead heartbeat because you were fired after your software was crap. <laughs> Design becomes very important now. When we're talking about design, we should be colorful, like my bird friend. We can also assume this is most likely a male bird because they tend to be the more colorful birds in the soft world, at least. 
taking that a step back, if we were to look at constructive interference or in, in constructive interference, if I could read, we'd be taking a sine wave plus a sine wave to equal a sine wave. And that would logically always come out as a series of birds in a beautiful formation migrating through the sky. But if we were to look at the implementation of that, what we really end up with nine times out of 10 with your software in particular, yes, I'm talking to you, is a bird crashing into your keyboard and destroying everything that you have. Now we want to take a look at destructive interference. And this is where a sine wave plus a sine wave becomes a dead heartbeat. And as we can see, we know that heartbeat is dead because this dog is running away with your target bird. <laughs> Back to waves. Now these waves are more literal than the last waves we talked about, which you'd really need an oscilloscope to look at. These waves you could look at with just your own personal eyes, those ones that you were born with. <laughs> That becomes the concept of customer perception. When we're thinking about looking at things with our own eyes, we have to remember that our customers are looking at our software with their own eyes. This means that our opinion of our software doesn't matter when their opinion is it's crap. What can you do today to fix this sine wave plus sine wave equals dead bird in a dog's mouth problem that you already know you have and you're resonating with extremely well right now? First, you can look at me and know that I can solve all of your problems with nothing but the bull I'm spitting right now. What else can you do today? You can look to the left with a more intelligent look, possibly stroke your beard, hold your glasses with a quisitive stare that really says, I have no idea what I'm talking about. You could also sit on a motorcycle in a three-piece suit, trying to look cool, <laughs> but really pulling off a look like it should be on the cover of some B-list magazine. And then finally, you could give up on all of these things, move to Montana, buy a cattle ranch, pick up some cattle, and then at that point, realize you should learn what the hell you're doing. Finally, <laughs> you can let your hair go completely astray in sine wave format, looking like a wave and allowing your software to be crap because you look like crap too. And therefore, this is all totally okay. All right, James, I, I, think, um, I think I nailed it, to be honest, Look, looking through this. I believe I got it probably better than you could get it. But I want to um, I want to hear your version anyway, just to see if I missed anything. Sure, sure, Joe. Well, you know, I hard to top what you did, um, but but let's do so. So, physics and why your future software will be crap. And so, uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So um, in the course of writing the book that I wrote on event-driven integration and using events to share real-time information between organizations uh, in a way that uh, we will see uh, our information and, and the information of commerce and business and everything um, propagate much more quickly through the different parties that are interested in that data. Um, one of the things that, uh, began to be clear in conversations with people is that there's some interesting parallels with physics. So first of all, what we know today about matter is that in fact, it's really, matter is made up of energy. It's, it's really, um, it's not that you can convert matter to energy, it's that there's energy there and you can release it. Um, so the, the heart and soul of everything that we know is actually, and if you go to, uh, is actually based on on kind of waves. And so there are parallels that we see in the real world that we can see around us, like gravity, with what we know about data and the movement of data. That exists. We know there's some parallels. So if we push that parallel as far as we can, what can that tell us a little bit about what we're going to see as these highly event-driven applications become the standard and the mass of what the way data is handled? So next slide. So the first thing that we can say is we know that we describe matter today at the quantum level in terms of waves, basically. So we, there's something called the wave function that describes the probability. All we can do at that level is really talk about probability. So wave function describes the probability 
of that particle being in any one place at any one time. Um, uh, and, and basically, yeah, basically that. So next, if we go to the next slide, what's interesting is we're now postulating that state changes reflected because they're reflected by moving events, right? That's what an event is. A event reflects a state change and you're communicating that um, in real time to the parties that are interested in it that a state change could potentially be measured by a form of a wave function that just sort of says, how important is that? What's the probability of that being important in any one context? So if you're looking for where is that event critical right now, what's the probability that it's going to be critical in any given context? So we go to the next slide. There we go. So part of the thing about waves and the waves work then is there are some standard kind of things that you see in the uh, in in the way that waves interact with each other. So one of them is you have constructive constructive inference and destructive inference in the wave patterns and how they interact with each other. Constructive inference is simply that if you bring two waves together you will double. You will create a wave that's the same frequency as the two, but double the amplitude. If, if they if they over the, the peaks overlap each other, if they are counter to each other, the peaks go to the troughs of the other wave. You'll actually get them canceling each other out, flat out, and you get that flat line uh, effect that Joe was talking about. But it's not your flat line; it is actually the flat line of the information moving through uh, the importance of the information moving through the system. So next slide. So what's so what becomes critical then and why your why your applications are going to suck because of this is because unless you have a strong understanding of how to design for this in a where you have no control over major parts of the system in which you're interacting with you are going to um, uh, have some huge issues so if you go to the next slide so for instance you could have the wonderful situation where you bring two incredibly pe important pieces of information together and basically you get, you know, the, the sum is greater than the parts in, in the sense that you get an incredible moving. And this is what everybody thinks they're going to get. Like, I just am going to get all this stuff is going to move through the system. and I'm going to get this beautiful outcome where my customers are always amazed and, and overjoyed with me. But in reality, when you do the implementation, next slide. You know, those events aren't necessarily going to move as fast as you think they're going to move. They're not necessarily going to contain all the information you absolutely thought they were going to have. You may even miss the fact that some events occurred because they weren't transmitted to you at all or they were there were problems in the transmission. The, the, the reality is going to destroy the design that you originally had and, and the function that you have of the system. So next slide you're going to have an awful lot of these situations where a really important piece of information enters a context where it gets negated by a lack of interest at the very least, if not other information that sort of makes it less interesting or less palatable to consume. And basically your, your application is essentially dead from the customer's perspective. In fact, if you go to the next slide, um, it's going to be so choppy and unpredictable, sometimes great, sometimes wonderful, sometimes whatever. Next slide. Your customers are actually going to see the system completely different than you do. They may believe that there's a completely fundamentally different thing going on in the background and that you're manipulating what's going on with what they're doing. And, and they're absolutely you know, absolutely going to have wonderful, wonderful theories of what are what's happening that you're going to have to overcome somehow with your system. So next slide. So what can you do today? Next. Well, really think, think hard about what are some of the things that you can be prepared for today? What are some of the controls and things that you can put in? Next slide. and contemplate how you're going to take this into the future. What are the different ways you can deal with things? 
and as you realize the complexity of what you're coming across and the number of controls and systems you have to deal with, likely my next piece of advice would be, next slide, maybe sort of prepare yourself for having to get the hell out of there. Next slide. <laughs> and maybe move to a ranch in the middle of freaking nowhere where it costs you $10,000 to get some e freaking ethernet to your house. <laughs> and next slide. You know, maybe, maybe you're going to write a manifesto or something, at, you know, against the event driven architecture of the future. And that would be totally understandable. And that's why your physics is the reason why your applications are going to be crap. Thank you. Bravo, bravo. Physics and pomade is what I'm hearing. <laughs> that, that was that was wonderful, James. So I, I'm so when we're looking at an event driven architecture, we're kind of I, I just want to make sure I got the gist. We're kind of moving from this concept of I own it all. I'm building the application, the full stack. I own the data, the format that data is received in. And we're moving into a world where you're accepting input from all sorts of different sources, providing input to all sorts of different sources. And without that level of control, we really need to think about systems in a very different way because we can't define all the variables. Is that is that a fair assessment? The, it's, a, it's such a combination of dependencies and um, and so so dependencies in terms of connectivity, dependencies in terms of data relationships, dependencies in terms of uh, of business outcomes and desired business outcomes. Um, a good example would be if you look at like real time inventory for a place like say Walmart or Target or something like that, right? Um, if or, or Amazon, if they display to you that you would they have X amount in stock, they're going to base that on information that they've received um, from their vendors somehow in some way. Now, a lot there's a lot of API driven stuff today where the vendors will say, okay, I'm going to report to you every so often. But um, I, if I remember correctly, I saw that Walmart was beginning to require an, an event streaming interface where um, the partner would stream. Um, uh, inventory events to Walmart. And, and then so Walmart would always have the most current, you know, count at any given time. But of course, the stream could be wrong, the stream could disappear, they could say the last update we had was 24 hours ago, do we trust the number that we have right now anymore? Do we just claim that we don't have that inventory right anymore? Um, and so from an end user's perspective, they don't know any of that, right? From an end user's perspective, what they're what they're going to see is there's zero or there's fifty or whatever that are out there, and so it becomes a customer experience problem to say how do we make sure that as we're processing all this data automatically without humans doing checks, without you know uh, uh, as fast as we possibly can. Uh, even faster than we were doing with APIs, even faster than we were doing with the kind of data analysis that we we're doing in the past versus what we can do with event streaming. How do we make sure that that customer experience remains reasonable and um, and we don't look like we're all over the map? And I think solutions are coming. I mean, I was joking a little bit about the running to the woods thing, obviously, although Joe, you should and have. But, um, but I think the, uh, but I think the truth, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that we are going to go through a period. Part of the reason flow is going to take a long time to be the standard out there is because we're going to go through a period of time where we're excited as hell. The good things are happening. And all of a sudden we get these interference patterns that we didn't expect just emerging out of the system as a whole. And we don't if we don't think about what are the controls we have to dampen down those waves when they happen or or restart those waves when they get canceled out you know if, if that's necessary um then uh then you know we can just end up with situations that that look really weird and it's not because anybody took an action to make it weird it's just the the data didn't flow in an expected way gotcha so that that inventory event feed coming into that theoretical Walmart is sine wave one from your diagram and Walmart's use and assumptions based on that feed is sine wave two. And if one comes in incorrectly, they overlap and cancel each other out. Yeah. So you could have a situation where, um, you know, a good example 
could potentially be something like um, uh, you are you have this wonderful inventory of you know just, let's just say uh, um, you know Lego Lego blocks or something I don't know it's just for for a simple something or or you know elephant stuffed elephants and you have this wonderful inventory that's available and you push that and um, and what you get at Walmart is that Walmart decides we have something against elephants right now. Um, you know, our, our rural fans are not big fans of stuffed an, uh, elephants, so we're going to take them off the shelf. So we have a negative interest in stuffed elephants, and that gets canceled out. And that's an intentional act, but you could imagine there might be a situation where they, you know, the the stuffed animal distribution service is down, you know, the just in time stuffed animal delivery service is down or something like that. And, and so it, it looks like Walmart's not interested. And, and so that data, those events went in there, what happens, right? What is the system prepared to understand um, how to kind of handle that situation and adjust to that situation? It makes a lot of sense. So, so as we were talking, uh, I think prior to the show, is there, you know, there's a lot of parallels between physics and computers and then computers back out to physics as Mark Burgess is working on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Smart space time, uh, is a really good book if you see it. Um, and the, uh, the, the critical thing about that is, um, the smart space, the idea of smart space time is he took the idea of the way computer networks work and the, the full system of computing over the internet and said, you know, uh, are there parallels if we think about the way that the all the concepts of physics interact with each other um, at different scales? And he said it would make sense that, you know, the quantum scale, things work differently than they work at the classical scale because it's the emergent behavior of the quantum scale that creates the behavior you see at the classical scale, much like the, the, the rules of how a router works or a switch work is really, really different than on the way that we perceive how we get information and, and request information and get information over the internet, right? So, um, uh, so, that's uh, that's I think the big thing, and uh, it, and it's uh, there's a lot more to it. Like that, just some of the things that he's run into. He had a recent blog post that's um, worth trying to find out there if you search for Mark's stuff on Twitter, um, where they taught they they figured out the dimensionality of the internet as a whole without using any AI or any sort of really complex data and analytics tricks. He's using, using some graph theory and some some of the space time smart space time concepts. And uh, so, you know, it's really fascinating stuff. But I, I do see, you know, again, there are parallels. When you have moving flow, you have flow dynamics. You know, we know that it's the same for water and air in a lot of ways. Why isn't it the same for data in the context of what is a pipe for data? What is it, you know, um, what is constraining and resistance and all of that stuff. But, um, but, certainly we will have some of those same things. So wave behaviors make sense too, right? Like, like, um, you know, what's the two split, uh, the, there's an experiment, famous experiment where you run light through photons through two slits. And instead of getting two beams of light, you get an interference pattern right. on the other end, like, like it was waves interacting coming through two slots. Right. Well, that, Right. You know, what does that mean for, for event driven systems and, and the distribution of events when the scale gets to the point where it's not just a point to point connection between two characters, two players. That's amazing stuff. It's very, very cool. I'm, I'm going to have to spend a little more time with this and probably go back to your book a bit. Um, in the meantime, Sabrina, are you ready to let James know the bad news of how much better I did and feel free to be specific with all of the reasons I did better than he did? You know, one of the things that you did, Joe, is someone did die in your story. <laughs> all died. I'm not really sure how that worked out. Although, James, you took us on an emotional roller coaster. We really, I, I felt relieved. I thought everyone was going to make it through. And then somehow we ended up in the wilderness. And I'm not sure if there was death involved. So either way, there was a, a higher amount of um, fatality than I expected. 
in the uh, Sabrina, the only death was dignity. In the- <laughs> <laughs> there was one manifesto, though. There was a manifesto. There was a manifesto, was, yeah. Yeah, and what is tech deck karaoke without a manifesto? Really, what are we doing if not for the manifesto? That's right. That's exactly right. So, on a scale, Joe, of one to ten, I would say you did negative five. Um, and James, on a one to ten, I would give you a ten. So, I'm going to have to give this one to James. Bravo. Bravo. By a small margin. <laughs> Small margin, yeah. By a small margin, but by a margin. Right. But Joe, I appreciate the um, the colorfulness, for sure, of the presentation. It was a good try, Joe. Good old college good try. Old college. Well, well, excellent. Thank so, you so, for so having Sabrina, so thank many, you so much. Thank you for having so many images on Google Images, too, Joe. I very much appreciate that as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> I try to make myself an easy target for our guests. Um, not that you <laughs> needed it. Uh, you, you did very well. And definitely had more pictures of me doing silly things than I expected in one slide deck. <laughs> <laughs> so you right, thank you Sabrina, thanks so much for putting up with us. James, thanks so much for joining us. That was awesome. And um, where can where can people find you on the interwebs? Uh, just first name, last name at, uh, you know, at signs of J- at James Urquhart on Twitter is by far the most of where I am um, to be found. Uh, and, uh, you know, if people want to reach out and, and ask questions or whatever. Uh, first initial last name, Jerry Urquhart at VMware.com. Are you taking physics questions specifically as it relates to quantum physics and or space time? Just a- um I will receive them, but whether or not my interest level interferes <laughs> with your interest level will be yet to be determined. So knowledge accepted. <laughs> and be sure to check out James' book, Flow Architectures. It's definitely worth reading. I believe it's available through O'Reilly. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah, uh, you can get it uh, on any major bookseller through O'Reilly. If you're an O'Reilly subscriber, you can read it for free on, on their site. So okay. it's all good. Well, brilliant. Thank you both. And thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoyed uh, at least James portion of this episode. (laughs) Bye, guys.